Hey, welcome to our AP Pre-Calc course. My name is Mr. Kelly from flipmath.com, and the first lesson is going to be change in tandem. This is 1.1. Now, a lot of this is review, so we're gonna jump right into it and kind of get us all on the same page. A function is a mathematical relation that maps a set of input values to a set of output values, such that each input is mapped to exactly one output. Now we have different names for the input and the output. Sometimes we go by domain. Remember domain, that's the input. Sometimes we call it the independent variable. Uh, we usually use an X for this, okay? Usually, you've seen that in algebra one and algebra two. The output values, that's what we call the range or the dependent variable. In AP stats, we call that the response variable, but that is usually denoted with a Y. So it's good to label your axes when you're looking at a function on a graph. Here is a graph of a function and I'll just label, uh, what do we label it, dependent and independent variable. And as I said, normally we put an X here and we put a Y here. That's traditionally how we did it in algebra one and algebra two. It's often useful to use other variables to help us recognize representation. For example, if we throw a football and measure the height, then we could use the variables where H is the height of the football and T is the number of seconds. Really, that's standard for time, right? So T is the number of seconds since the football was thrown. Now, you have to be careful when you pick your variables. I didn't pick S because it kind of looks like a five, and I have to make sure my T has a little tail on it. We have to be really clear when we're writing these things. But the point is you can use any variables you want to. And if we want to use function notation using our defined variables, then T would be the input, so it goes inside the parentheses, and H would be the output. And we could also use the words domain and range, independent variable, dependent variable, et cetera, et cetera. How would I draw this? on a set of axes, well, just like we use X and Y, you've done this before, okay? We wanna put the input on the horizontal axis, so we'd put T here, that would stand for time. I would fix my axis, because it looks terrible. Uh, and then the output would be H of T, and that stands for the height, okay? So we have our two variables, we have T and we have H, and H of T is uh, represents the function where there's some relationship between the two. So let's practice with number one here. It has new variables. W of X is a function where W is the amount of water in a pool measured in gallons, and X is the length of the pool. What does the independent variable represent? All right, well, this is not a trick question. Remember, independent variable, that is the input. Okay, so that's gonna be right here. That's the X. So it represents in this uh, scenario, we have to go and read it. It's the length of the pool. So that's what the independent variable represents. And then part B is the dependent variable. What does that represent? Well, dependent variable is going to be the first variable here. It's the W, and the W is the amount of water in the pool measured in gallons. So this is easy enough where the independent is going to be in the parentheses and the dependent will be outside the parentheses. Well, that brings us to the lesson name here, varying in tandem. These two variables will vary in tandem okay, according to a function rule that's established. So they have to tell you a rule. Now, how do they tell you this rule? Well, the rule can be expressed verbally, analytically, numerically, or graphically. Now, if you notice, we're gonna take the first letters of all those, and we're gonna call it bang, and that's gonna remind us of the four different ways we can represent a function. Y'all gonna be vampires. Can you imagine if they made that into a movie or a book? A bunch of teenagers running around the forest looking for vampires. How can you express these functions verbally, analytically, numerically, graphically? We're looking under trees and whatever for them. It's about the worst book ever. That's the worst book idea ever, I think. All right, so now we're gonna talk about whether a function is increasing or decreasing. So a function is increasing, we say verbally, as the input values increase, the output values always increase. So input values, remember, horizontal axis, as you go to the right, the output values, which is the uh, vertical axis here always increase. It always goes up. As you go to the right, it's always going up. That's what it means verbally to be an increasing function. Now, analytically. Analytically means we're looking at it uh, through a lens that's a little more technical for all A and B in the interval. Okay, so let me pick two values of A and B. I'm just gonna use this graph. I know we haven't gotten there yet, but I'm gonna pick two values of A and B. Okay, so I've picked two input values, A and B, and A is less than B, right, because it's on the left-hand side. Then F of A has to be less than F of B. Well, let's find those values. For A, if I go up to the function, this value right here, I go over to uh, the vertical axis, this represents F of A, or it's the Y value, right? But it's F of A. 
And then we look at what the output value, that, ooh, that'd be way up here, for B, if we put B as the input, then the output value for B would be right over here. This would be F of B. And our rule says if A is less than B, which it is, then F of A is going to be less than F of B. Guess what else makes sense? It's your turn. Instead of me just giving you decreasing function, you're going to look at what we put down for increasing function and use it as a model uh, to fill out this box right here, decreasing function. So go ahead and pause the video and fill that out. Give it your best attempt. It's pretty easy. I think you can do it. So check it out. Did you just replace the word increase with decrease? As the input values increase, which means the x-axis, the horizontal axis, as they increase or go to the right, the output values always decrease. That's verbally. Now, analytically, if A is less than B, which means on the left of it, then when you evaluate A, it has to be greater than when you evaluate B. That's how it decreases. Graphically, we get this nice graph. But there is one part of the Vang that we're leaving out, numerically. In this example, it says let the function f be increasing or decreasing, but not both. Okay, so we know that it doesn't have like a dip in here where it goes down and comes back up. It's either completely increasing or completely decreasing. State whether the function is increasing or decreasing, easy part, and then justify. Also easy part, but a little more difficult. So let's look at the table we have right here. We notice that the input values are increasing. So as the input values increase, we notice that the output values also increase and they always increase for each value that we have okay so how would we write that well justifying kind of looks like this we would say that f is increasing on the interval from 4 to 20 and this is how we write it using uh, inequality notation we put the lower bound in the upper bound x is in the middle and we're saying that x has to be greater than the lower bound but less than the upper bound okay it is increasing on that interval because for all a and b in the interval and we're talking about the input values. If A is less than B, then F of A is less than F of B, meaning you can pick any two values here. We'll pick this one, we'll pick this one. If this is A and this is B, and it says if A is less than B, which it is, okay, then F of A is less than F of B, which is true. That is a justification uh, using technical language that we're going to have to learn how to do throughout this course. So now we enter the very last part of the notes. We're going to review the different parts of a graph, the important parts, right? So the first one is called the zero. The graph intersects the x-axis, the independent, that's a horizontal one, right? When the output value is zero. That makes sense. The y value zero is right here and right here and right here. We look at those input values and we call them zeros. So let's label that zeros. So we call this one a zero, this value here, whatever it is, this value right here, they're all called zeros. Now, on the other axis, if that equals zero, okay, so if x equals zero, the input value is zero, we call the output, what do we call that thing right there? The y-intercept. So let's just draw a little line up there. That's called the y-intercept. All right, so those are some important parts when you either have the input or the output equal to zero. Notice that the, uh, what do we have? Several different zeros, right? We can have multiple zeros but we can only have one y-intercept because if we have another one, it's not a function because then you have two outputs. So let's talk about concavity now. Concavity really describes the shape of the graph. So we have concave up and concave down. Concave up is like a bowl that's facing up. It's like your normal, you know, like a cereal bowl. You're gonna put something in it. So that's concave up. We say that the slope is always increasing. Notice how the slope is negative here and then the slope becomes zero, and then the slope starts increasing, and it creates that bowl effect right here. That is concave up. Let's, let's move that. Mr. Kelly trying to figure out how to work his computer today. All right, here we go. That's concave up right there. And then concave down is the opposite. It's when your slope is always decreasing. So notice we have a high slope here, and then it starts getting uh, less steep, less steep, and then it's horizontal right about here, and then it starts going down to the negative. So this part of the graph is concave down. So I'm gonna trace it just so we, we know what we're looking at. This part is concave down. Usually there's a maximum right there and concave up. We have a minimum value, but we'll talk about those later. Now, straight lines, they don't have concavity because their slope doesn't change, right? Straight lines have a constant slope. And we have one more thing called a point of inflection. The point of inflection we're gonna put right here, or it's called the inflection point, 
Do you notice how this is concave down? So the slope's kind of decreasing, and decreasing, and, but then it changes its mind and it starts going the other way, right? That's called the inflection point. It's where the slope stops decreasing and starts to increase. Or it could be the other way if the graph was going the other way. But essentially, it's the point that kind of divides the concave down and the concave up. It's the point right in the middle there. That is called a point of inflection or an inflection point. All right, so now let's use all that information and we'll answer some of these questions. Use the graph below of F to answer the following question. Okay, so part A first. When is the graph concave up? Now remember, concave up means it's like a regular old bowl. It's kind of like that. The slope is always increasing. So I can see that this whole part from here all the way to maybe I, I looks like an inflection point, right? Notice how that looks like a bowl that could hold something, but then it's flipped over. Okay, this is concave down, so we'll do that part next. But then it kind of starts again right here. Looks like K is an inflection point. So we're gonna write this two ways. We're concerned about the X values. Where is the graph concave up? And we're talking about the X values. So first we, we'll write an inequality. So if X is this way, which is less than I. So X has to be less than I, comma, and then X can be greater than K. That is one way to write it. So X less than I, X greater than K, but now I'm gonna write it using uh, interval notation. Interval notation, some students, they don't like it, but we're gonna use parentheses and we start all the way to the left. And the way I think about it is, I just kind of run along the X axis here. Where does it start? Where does it stop? Where does it start? Where does it stop? Actually, it goes forever to the left, so that's negative infinity. And then it goes all the way up to this part right here. So that is I, that's the X value I. And then we put a U for union with, it means with another piece. And then it starts here at K. And then it runs all the way to infinity. All right, so that is our answer for when the graph is concave up. Pause the video now, and you figure out where the graph is concave down. Did you find this piece right here? So if we're gonna use an inequality, how would we do that? I love writing inequalities. So start at the low value, i, and it goes all the way to k. Okay, that's concave down. Put the x in the middle, and then we're gonna put our less than signs like this. So x has to be greater than i, but x has to be less than k. That's how you can write it with an inequality, but this is just two slashes. If we're gonna use interval notation, uh, we start at i, and we go all the way to k. That's a little easier. Okay, part C, find the zeros. Well, the zeros are where the Y value is zero. The output has to be zero. So we're looking at G, so X has to equal G. And then this value here, which is M. So X would equal M. All right, find the Y intercepts of the function. Well, that's where X equals zero. That's right here. We're kind of telling you in the graph that this value is A. So this is kind of weird. So we would just write Y equals A the y value would be a there. Okay, it's negative something, but it's the value whatever a is. When is the graph increasing? Okay, so remember increasing means that for every value, if you go to the right, it's gotta be higher, basically. So we're looking at from h to j, that's gonna be increasing. So we're gonna say when x is between h and j, so we can write it with inequalities like this. Uh, what else we have? Increasing, now it's decreasing. It's increasing here again from l till infinity. So then I would just say that X has to be greater than L. All right, now using interval notation on these. Ooh, what do we got here? So I would probably write it like that. H to J union with L to infinity. That's the increasing. And lastly, where is this graph decreasing? Well, it's decreasing all the way down to here to, to uh, we go from negative infinity. Oh, let's try this. So X has to be less than this value, and it, this whole piece is decreasing. So x is less than h. All right, where else is it decreasing? From j all the way down to l. So from j to l, put x in the middle, then put your less than signs, okay? Now if we use uh, interval notation, for the first one, we're gonna go negative infinity all the way to h, union with and we're looking at decreasing J down to L. All right, J to L. So that is a review. We have two different ways we could write it. We have, uh, when we're talking about the domain or the input values, we have inequalities. We also have uh, interval notation. 
Remember zeros and y-intercepts are just single values, so we can just list them, list them as equal to. And that's about it. That's the whole lesson. Should be mostly review, maybe some new stuff there. Here's some tips for success. Number one, you just took notes. So you're already doing the first part. Make sure you complete the practice and check your answers. And please, if you have any questions, work with your classmates and ask for help from your teacher. If you do all those things, I guarantee you will pass the mastery check. This is Mr. Kelly, and I'm gonna say this after every video. Remember, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. See ya.